Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this lovely spring afternoon. And so nice of you to come indoors with us. Um, but we're here to help launch the exhibition, Liz Larner. Don't put it back like it was. And I'm glad you're all here to help us um, celebrate that occasion. Uh, I'm Mary Sarudi. I'm the executive director of the Walker Art Center, and I'm also the curator of this exhibition. So I'm especially pleased to welcome, welcome everyone today. I also want to uh, take a moment and welcome our virtual audiences because today's conversation is being live streamed and it will eventually be made available on the Walker website as well. And uh, it's also, uh, we have ASL interpretation, so um, I want to thank our interpreter for being here as well. Uh, for those of you that are in the building, I'll just mention that the galleries are open until 6 p.m. this evening. So if you haven't actually had the opportunity to see the exhibition yet, you'll have some time after the after our conversation. So, of course, we absolutely want you to visit the, the show. As we gather for this program, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Walker Art Center and the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden are located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homelands of Dakota people. Situated near, near Bede Manakaska and Witatopa Bede, or Lake of the Isles, on what was once in a, a site, uh, an expanse of marshland, this site holds meaning for the Dakota, Ojibwe, and other indigenous people who still live here today. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed for the founding of the Walker, and we recognize that as a museum in the United States, we benefit from, we are beneficiaries of the land and, the, and its resources. By remembering that past, uh, we, continue, we recognize the continuing harm in the present and resolve to work towards reconciliation and healing in support of Dakota people and the land itself, specifically through artistic and educational programs as well as community and curatorial partnerships. So today's program, uh, many of you who visit the Walker regularly have been experiencing Liz Larner's work for um, some time now because her beautiful sculpture X graces our entrance and has been there since 2017. It's really uh, a pleasure for me to now share more of her work with all of you and audiences here in the Twin Cities. Um, the exhibition has been co-organized with Sculpture Center in New York and I actually started working on the show while I was there um, and it's been great to have it evolve and, ha and having presented it in New York and now bringing it here. Um, just a little bit of background before we really jump in. You know, I had been um, following Liz's work for many years. I had seen it in group exhibitions, in um, the occasional gallery exhibition in New York. But it, um, you know, I was really intrigued and I realized that I didn't... Um, know as much about it as I wanted to, which as a curator is a really excellent reason to pursue an exhibition, um, to learn more about it and then share what your, you know, your discoveries with others. So um, that process has been just extremely rewarding for me. And, um, and I think that, you know, when it opened in New York, and then again, um, seeing it here at the Walker last night, I, I can't help but feel like after, um, you know, it's so much about this um, being in the space with people and the sculptures. And I think after these last couple of years where um, we have not had a lot of shared experiences, especially with strangers, it's just, you know, it just feels like what we need. It's like, it's not about the screens. It's about the tactility, about the space, about you know, formal relationships and psychological relationships and, um, and emotional relationships. And I think that um, it just feels really great to be with this work at this moment, I would say. Um, before I introduce Liz and <laughs> ask her to join me on the stage, I want to begin with some very important thank yous. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the show was shown in New York in uh, January through March, and I really want to extend special thanks to Kyle Danswitz, who's with us today. He is the deputy director at Sculpture Center, and he was an amazing partner on the project. He started working with me while I was still at Sculpture Center on the project, and then um, really became a, a curatorial, intellectual, uh, logistical partner in every possible way. Um, as well as shepherding the beautiful catalog um, and just has really helped make the show a success. 
Uh, I want to acknowledge the generous support of uh, those who made the Walker presentation of the exhibition possible. Walker trustee John Christakos and his wife Debbie, Walker trustee Donna Polad and her husband Jim, trustee Susan White and her husband Rob, and trustee Carlo Bronzini Vendor. Our presentation was also generously funded by patrons Sonia Fernandez and Daniel Rangel. And I want to thank J.P. Morgan Private Bank for sponsoring the Walker presentation and Pilar Opedesano for her support and advocacy of the show and her service as a Walker trustee. So I, if we have some J.P. Morgan guests, I want to make sure I welcome them as well. I'm very happy to acknowledge Liz's galleries for their support of the exhibition uh, catalog, Gallery Metz Hetzler, the Modern Institute, and Regan Projects, and an a real special thank you to Sean Kaylee Reagan, who uh, has just been a great partner on the show, um, on the catalog, on the exhibition, supported the catalog, helped raise money for the catalog, and just really um, facilitated loans and um, organized, was just, the gallery was great. Thank you for your help. Um, and speaking of the catalog, I want to mention the team at Dancing Foxes who uh, were the public, who produced the catalog, and it's for sale in the Walker shop, if you haven't seen it, take a look at it. It's really, it's visually and materially amazing <laughs> um, and satisfying and in including ha having lots of images of the work, their contributions by Connie Butler, uh, Ariana Raines, Catherine Liu, and a conversation between me and Liz, which will be different than the conversation that we're going to have today. <laughs> I promise. Um, and of course, I have to acknowledge the amazing, talented staff of the Walker Art Center who've made the show come to life here and will be um, you know, interpreting it and sharing it with our audiences over the next few months. And then uh, lastly, to Liz's uh, studio team, Nadie and Alex, who came in for the opening and helped on the installation of the show, and uh, her family, husband Tom and Eldon, who I can imagine have been supportive all the way along <laughs> and and uh, were able to travel to Minneapolis to see the show as well. So with all of that, now I want to come to the main event, which is to introduce Liz Larner. Uh, Liz was born in Sacramento in 1960, and she uh, attended uh, California Institute of the Arts, uh, where she initially studied photography, and we may come back a little bit to that conversation before she really... Um, sort of committed herself in a major way to sculpture. Um, as I think is evident from the show, but, um, but it's also from her exhibition history and, um, and critical response, Liz is one of the most influential sculptors of her generation, I would say. And um, it's, her work has been in major exhibitions and collections, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Aspen Art Museum, Nasher Sculpture Center, um, the Whitney Museum of American Art, many, many more, including where she has been included in several biennials, <laughs> Constala Basel. She really just has an extraordinary um, exhibition history, and um, we're excited to add to that with this show. <laughs> um, so I also just have to extend an enormous personal thanks to Liz, um, both for making the work that she does, uh, because as I said, I just think it's the work we need and um, I'm, I'm just happy it's in the world. And um, her intellect and her rigor and her um, inventiveness and commitment to materials and to politics and all of these things have just been, it's been a really um, in, inspirational and re enriching experience these last few years working with her. So thank you for your collaboration and trusting me with, uh, with the work. So with that, Join me in welcoming Liz to the stage. Oh. Yes? Yeah. Sound good? Okay. Hello. Great. So uh, I thought the format we would take, since we have the work <laughs> just in the galleries, uh, nearby, um, but I don't know that everybody has seen it. I thought it would be helpful to have some visuals so that we have that reference point, and when we start talking about a piece, you know what we're talking about. It'll also sort of focus our conversation because, as you might imagine, Liz and I have been 
having many, many conversations and we can really wind and get <laughs> get on lots of different tracks, which is super fun, but it would take a lot longer than we have this afternoon. So we wanted to sort of focus the conversation on a few works um, and uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll take some questions at the end. So um, I guess I also, I, I wanna also just start by saying that I think I love sculpture for many of the same reasons that Liz does. Um, I was the director of a place called the Sculpture Center for 20 years, so it's no big surprise that I'm committed to sculpture. Um, but I think what you know, what I love about it is the way in which um, you know you experience it with our whole. We experience it with our whole bodies, and we use all of our senses to take it in. And it's um, and it and for that reason, it's sort of different every time it appears in a different space or in a, you know, at a different moment in time. Um, so in so I guess that's kind of also leads me to why I wanted to start with um, the work that's actually not technically in the show, <laughs> but introduces the show, <laughs> which is X. Um, as I mentioned, it was uh, installed in 2017. And um, it, it introduces people to the walker every time they come. <laughs> And, um, and now to this exhibition. But I wanted to start here because I think it's an opportunity to talk about um, how your investigation into some of the fundamental uh, concerns of sculpture, like you know, surface and structure, positive and negative space, um, form and volume, um, how all of those things really help us to orient ourselves in space. And, um, and an X in particular is sort of an amazing thing because it's like the declarative mark. It's a, um, you know, it's abstract and geometric, but it's also a cancellation sometimes. And it's the variable, it's the unknown factor, which just makes it so rich. So let's just start there and tell us about how you came to make X. Um, well, so I've made a number of X sculptures and works over the years. And um, I just, find that it's such an interesting form really that it's so simple uh, or maybe this is why it can hold so much and you know x is kind of an illimitable symbol in the sense that it can mean anything that's you know in algebra <laughs> and and just the way it can be the holder for anything and and it is and it always will be and so it just gains meaning as time goes on and can change change itself to mean whatever. And so I thought that was kind of a great um, motif, I guess, or a great form to try to investigate in sculpture because it is so, such a simple form. So, um, you know, there was an addition that I did that was um, X's and one side of the X was um, very kind of uh, rigorously drawn and meticulous and formed and the other side was just made from wax and very chunky and they kind of fit together and there and then each side was there was a set of colors and was painted the different colors and then they were shown on an x shaped base and um there's a piece that the hirshhorn um is going to be showing when they finish their garden that's an x it's called six um and uh but this x uh you know, before the one that's in the garden, I mean, in the in front of the building, I made, it was such a complicated thing to make something like that in stainless steel that I made a wooden one. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the model to make, to make sure, because it was such a huge kind of effort and investment to make it. And, um, and so I, I did do this on the computer and, um, the way that I did it was uh, there was a form that's like I I don't say what it is that I so I established what the X was how it was going to be formed and then I draped it over this form and so I feel like what's happening here is you know you don't know if it's sinking into the ground or it's coming out of the ground and it ha at certain I had the experience when I got here that I walked the back way around so I I saw it again and you know it sort of shape shifts as you move around it. And because it's highly polished stainless steel, it takes on whatever the condition of the moment is onto its own surface. So mm -hmm. it's um, very sh changing, and um, but and it shows you different sides of that that you know you don't have to that you're not seeing like mirrors reflecting in different places. So so 
that's that's the story. Is I, I hope I've ha- answered I the question. I, I think so. I think so. If people have more, we can get back. Okay. We can come back to Sounds it. Sounds good. Um, why don't we move into the exhibition? I think um, I I guess I will also say that I have not organized these slides in chronological order um, or in the order that you see the work in the show, um, and I think partly that it's worth pointing out that the show is not organized. It's not installed. It's neither chronological nor exactly thematic. Um, it's really organized in a way to bring forward some of uh, some of these investigations and some of the threads that run through the work. And I think one of the benefits of being able to do a survey is actually making those connections across works and across time, um, which has just been exciting and, and fun. And I think, but I also think it has to do with how you like how time works in <laughs> in your body of work, and um, I it made me think about um, the Pauline uh, Paulina Pabocha from who's a curator at the Museum of Modern Art did a brilliant talk at Sculpture Center um, while the show was up there, and I and she among many interesting insightful things she had to say about the work, um, she she talked about Rosie Berdotti's description of um, the present as multi-directional, which I thought, it, which is a really um, concise way to talk about some of the way that we experience this time and in, in this kind of a show um, where it's not a, you know, a linear sense of time or movement through the space, you could take different directions and, and paths through the show. Um, and I think that that, uh, you know, the diversity of materials and approaches you use in your work um, you know, are really sort of this, it's it's a sort of, restless makes it sound, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a positive word, but I mean it in the most positive way, <laughs> um, that it's sort of this restless investigation of these ideas that um, appear and reappear at different moments across um, really decades of work. So we'll start, this is a piece called Two as Three and Some Two, um, and I wanted to show it and also show this piece, which is called Untitled, um, to start talking about, you know, we we started with X and talked a little bit about that sort of X as a mathematical symbol <laughs> and that variable form, but also how it um, it it's a uh, it's different from all these perspectives over time and pr- approach and things like that. And this piece has a similar quality to it <laughs> in that it you perceive its form completely differently. And I think both of these pieces are also really good examples of how you work with form and color. So um, can you talk a little bit about that relationship between form and color? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so you know, when I, I first started um, making sculpture and l- investigating and looking at sculpture, you know, it seemed to me that, um, by and large, not in every case, of course, that um, color was used to reinforce form. And I thought that um, like both form and color are stronger than that. And I wanted to try to see you know, what would happen if the color didn't follow the form and what could you do with that. And in, in this work, um, I think, you know, and hopefully some of you have seen it in the gallery, and it, it has to do with movement too. So in every position, there's this it's kind of, it's one way I've described it before is you see the reality and the illusion of the piece at the same moment, like it keeps switching back and forth. And so at some points you just see the two cubes, one resting on the other, and then the colors start connecting and making these other forms that become almost like, and are in some respects just as real, maybe not as physical, but just as real as the two cubes sitting on top of each other. And so that idea, you know, is, I think that's also evident in like Reticule, which is the first piece that you come into, is that gallery one? Mm-hmm. On, in gallery one, when you- uh, The first thing you see when you walk in the gallery. Yeah, yeah, and so you see it even from the lobby, and to me, it looks pretty flat. And then you walk in, and you really can't, uh, your body and your movement around the sculpture kind of tells you the size of it, not not your eyes, not your visual perception, because of the color and the way red, like that red is a, 
a color that is like a medium that stays in the middle and blue recedes. So the red is kind of like pulling the form together visually, but that's not really happening physically, but it's, it's kind of an illusion, but it's also like the truth of color, which is, you know, which color is such a, you know, it's not something that in some respects is really there either. You know, it's a play of light. So, so, so that's, yeah. Yeah, and then this piece, um, it's one of my few pieces that's called Untitled. And um, in the gallery for, for some people, because this, it is hard. It has been difficult to be a person that um, switches things up a lot. And I think that's a hard thing for people to follow sometimes and it's I've experienced that in the past but what I say to some people I'm like well it, this piece if you want to know what my work is about it's all it's all in this piece <laughs> in a way um, because uh, as you approach it from the side from gallery two it just it looks like this mass on the wall that's made of rectilinear forms and um, and well cube cubic forms and it's like this kind of jumble or m mass of, of different lines going all over the place. But then as you s um, move to stand in front of it, there's an alignment, which you can see kind of here, where, where the colors line up. And then as you move again, that shifts. And so I, th I think it's... It, I think that's why I called it untitled, and I don't. I don't think I have any other untitled works because it just, <laughs> it just does, it just does it. Which is something that I love about the receivership of sculpture. You know, you it, it's not that you're not thinking, but you're moving and you're you're knowing through your perception and the thoughts that follow from that. Yeah, and I think that that sense of, um, you know, with with uh, two as three and some two, that idea that like we understand what a cube is <laughs> and you know, like the space that we're in are usually they're rectilinear and that's so stable. And then you come across this form where, which has like destabilized all of that. And then it's like, well, is a cube stable? I don't know, I don't know anymore. <laughs> which well, the lines are all equal. They are all equal, but, but they're not, um, uh, they're not in 90 degree angles to each right. other. So it's, I mean, I don't even know if it's, if technically, it's technically a cube. I, I, I mean, I think, I think it is because of the measurement, mm -hmm. but in, you know, it, it kind of, it makes you question that, I guess. Yes, absolutely. So um, you were talking about these interlocking forms, which leads us nicely <laughs> to guests, um, which is a series of works. These, these, this is actually a detail of the one on the um, left. Yeah, left from here. <laughs> so these are two examples. Um, there are actually four examples in the exhibition. Um, and um, they have a really beautiful relationship to um, to the space that they occupy, but also I think in terms of like the parts to the whole and, and the potential for a fluidity of form. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so guests, um, they, they come in different, um, they're all stain, a welded stainless steel and then they're plated with different metals. There's um, a, a gold plated one and, a, well actually it's just two different metals with um, some different, um, so it's gold, gold plated, silver plated, and then silver plated that is oxidized so it, it looks kind of blackish or brownish. And, um, and then the sections are either round or square. And so it's very, it, but in, in other respects, it's the same pattern. And, and the thing that took the longest was to figure out the way to link it so that it wouldn't bind as a, as a form. So it was a fluid moving um, mass. And it, it, it relates to ideas about drawing in space, um, which, you know, just the, the buildup uh, when it, when it's all together in a mass, you know, it's just very organized and kind of satisfying order of these um, three-dimensional links. And, um, but like in, in this one, when it starts to be bundled up, you know, it, it acts like a drawing, like building up of line weight um, to make things seem darker or, you know, and more open to make it seem lighter. So it's like the realization of that in space. And then to, you know, 
a sculpture, usually it stays in one place and that's where it's supposed to be. It's like if it's a floor piece, it's on the floor and it stays like this. And so this, these pieces, the idea is that, you know, they don't have that. They can, they can really be anywhere. They can be. And they don't have a form. They, well, they I have mean, they a, have a form. They, they have a form. I yeah, think you're they right. have a form that's flexible, ex- flex- extremely a flexible. flexible. You know, it has form. limitations. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, it's, it's. I wouldn't say it's formless, and it's not like extensive mm-hmm. overall. It has its limitations, but within that limitation, it has a lot of variability and yeah. possibilities. Yeah. Um, and it is, you know, as you said, it's inner. It's it's interwoven. It's like a a links of. It's like a three dimensional chain kind of um which brings us back to actually one of the first one of the first pieces we see in the exhibition here called wrapped corner um which is a piece that's made with uh tension so that you have two steel attachments to the wall and then this is found chain that gets um uh wrapped across the two between the two around the corner um, which I um, I feel like sets up the exhibition really well because it it sort of sets up this idea about balance between sort of um, uh, sort of a resistance you know what it means to have resistance but also um, dependence there's sort of a vulnerability because of course if the chain gets pulled too taut the wall starts to crumble and then it'll lose its tension and the, you know so it sort of has the potential to destroy itself. <laughs> um, which I really like, and it, um, and I wanted to sort of talk about it a little bit in relation to Corner Basher, which um, because d- just as an opportunity to talk about corners, <laughs> because I think that um, I mean we could talk a lot about all kinds of things with both of these pieces, but I thought it was an opportunity to talk about corners because it is the you have found corners to be sort of powerful, interesting sites and have activated them and worked with them. Um, in the work, and I and I think, you know, I think about them as sort of marginalized in a way. They're also sometimes, you know, like people get sent, bad children get sent to the corner, right? <laughs> Not um, anymore. So I you, hope. <laughs> no, I, I think, yeah, hopefully, <laughs> we already <laughs> don't do that anymore. That, yeah. But they used to do that. Um, but um, but you've embraced corners. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about corners? Yeah, um, you know, it's another space that. Uh, wasn't really o- occupied too much in um, modern sculpture or, you know, uh, even <laughs> pre-modern sculpture. Um, so it's it's just, um, there were niches, but the corner was, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting place, you know, and I think you said yesterday, I liked what you said, that, you know, if there isn't a corner, then it's like, it's just planes. It's not like a three-dimensional space. You know, there needs to be some kind of intersection for that space to occur. And and so, yeah, I just I there's a, a number of works that I've done. And and here, what is a really great for me is that wrap corner. And I can talk about this individually, but I just kind of want to set the scene. Um, so wrap corner is on the outside of this wall when you come in. And then when you come around the corner, you see corner basher, but then in the corner that's made by that exterior corner as you come in is this very delicate work called to the wall. And then there's firestone. And so so there's, you know, there's this kind of intense um, display of, like you said, like balance, of the balance and strength kind of holding each other there and in intention without um either one sort of or they're either helping each other or, or either one isn't giving giving way right. <laughs> so right. um and then um corner basher you know is this piece that it, i think it gets too much attention <laughs> <laughs> but um but uh it it is a piece that you know my idea with it was to you know, put something in the corner again into this space that's not in the arena because uh, at the time I, I had seen um, survival research and they were doing like um, performances in these arenas and and the operators of these their machines were on the side, you know, operating the machines that were kind of battling each other, making the show in the center of a um, space. And so two things came from that. One was that, you know, I, oh, I would like to do something in the corner. And 
also that I would let the, I think the, the main thing about it is, you know, which is often in the past has not been even mentioned or in the photograph is the on off um, speed control, which gives, gives the, it's the idea of agency and, um, you know, that, and it's very social situation, you know, to be doing that in this space. And so if that, someone can turn it off someone and turn it up, someone else can come and turn it down and and how we manage that in, in, a not, in an unusual space, but it's not an unusual thing that we're doing because I like liken it to driving like on the freeway or in traffic and just that sensibility of knowing what where your fellow drivers are at any given time and when you have to you know get around them or slow down and it's that kind of but when i think when it's put in this context you know it it, it like the meaning of that becomes greater i th i hope that's what that was the, that was the idea Yes, I mean it does get a lot of attention because it, it is. Um, <laughs> it draws a lot of attention to itself. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, and interestingly, um, these pieces also share a space with Corner yeah. Pasture <laughs> in our show. Um, and the this is these two pieces are from a series of culture pieces that um, Liz was making in the late eighties and maybe even into the early nineties. Made when you saw that when you saw it, Regan, it was made like in 2015 or whatever. Oh, so yeah, so you've been continuing to make them. I make them every once in a while. Every once in a while, yeah. Um, but I think these uh, these works to me are really important in a survey exhibition because I think they um, really speak to how you think about stability and process and materiality. <laughs> um, so would you talk about how you started making these cultures and you know what was interesting to you about that the um the instability you know that relationship between process and stability um yeah i think you know well it was it's kind of you know it's just interesting to me it was when i realized it back in the 80s that um you know these two terms the scientific terms were so um in line with the cultural terms that, you know, it's called a culture and it has a media that's um, in it. And, um, and uh, there's, a, there's a growth, which is called a bloom. And then there, and so, you know, when there, and there's a life cycle and uh, there's time, time is involved and decay is involved eventually. And so this piece is kind of about that. Um, so every time it's put um, together, so we put it together day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, it always has the orchid, buttermilk, and a penny. And the penny we tried to get and did. We got a 2022 penny. So the penny kind of marks um, the year that it, the these elements were put together and um there's always the fresh one that we make and then the last one that was shown and so there's i just think it there's a lot of um it's a lot about the body and not a human body a, as a, that subject but mm -hmm. that the, the sense of our um our bodies and our lifespans right. and uh and and decay, and you know, decay gets a bad rap in our culture. <laughs> um, it's essential to life, and um, it's uh, literally like in um, plants and uh, and animals. Like I was just reading about this thing. I think it was in, I think it's in Minnesota, or maybe about this Wolf Island, where there's this island. I think it's in Minnesota, and they brought all these wolves there. And they realized that the wolves were doing a lot of good because they were taking the moose that were there that were old. And when the when the uh, wolves weren't there, there was this, there was actually a die off of, of the moose mm -hmm. and the wolves were actually helping that. But so just that idea, you know, and anybody that has a compost pile knows this, <laughs> um, you know, what, um, you know, what is thrown away if it's treated properly becomes the um, 
seeding ground for the next life. And um, so I think that that's kind of all in, in these these works, and especially in Orchid Buttermilk Penny, since you have both of them there. Yeah, I think um, that uh, that brings us to the ceramics, and to my mind, that you know that does relate because when you th we think of you know we think of ceramic as sort of this hard um you know stable permanent <laughs> material but really it is like it, it's the it's the result of a very 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 long process <laughs> of decay and transformation of material right and then you know you're sort of taking a last step in its transformation when you actually form it and fire it um, but it's actually as a material, it, you know, is that is a product of that kind of pro uh, transformation, and um, so I'm sus I suspect that's one of the things that draws you to clay. But I think there are probably some other things that um, I'd love for you to talk about. And, and so why yeah why are you drawn to clay and why do you hang these on the wall? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well yeah I mean clay. You know, I'm really interested in color, and um, and so clay doing these pieces is a way for me to um, have a form. The forms and now it's been over ten years that I've been using these ba kind of basic forms, and they're all pretty much the same size. But some of them are like the gray one is a Cesura, which is you know the one with the break, and then the one that. Uh, this one right here is a called a subduction, which and that's a ge geologic term. It's uh, when one plate goes under another, mm -hmm. and the ancestra is a, a poetic term that means a, like a break, a break in a poem. So it's it's not two things. It's not a diptych. It's just a rupture within inside, inside one thing. And then um, this one, <laughs> these are called califactions. And they're the ones that are um, flat. And there's also one cl it's called mantle. We don't have any mantles here. That are just they are also just flat. So you know most of the names refer to geologic um, uh, terms and places within the strata of the earth. And um, calefaction means produced by heat, which you know mountains and you know geologic but but these these so these stones are uh, embedded into the wet clay and then fired so the kind of result is due to calefaction and same with glaze mm -hmm. and these are these two are um earlier and i didn't i wasn't always using glaze i was using and i still do sometimes use epoxy um with pigment in them but uh I w felt more sure of that process than glazing because it's such a tricky thing. I had to learn a few things before I really started. But now I'm mostly glazing. Fantastic. I think uh, you bring oh, up I didn't color ask, again. I didn't answer why I put them on the wall. No, you didn't. Do you, <laughs> why don't you answer that? <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. I just remembered you asked me that. Um, well, I, I, you know, I wanted to put, I mean, I don't think that... Um, I, I think it's great when sculpture jumped off the base and got went onto the floor, but it's been on the floor for the a while, and the wall is a space that I think sculpture can occupy. and And I don't really, I don't really say, and I'm not sure I really know um, if these are sculptures. Some people are like, it's painting. I'm like, no, it's not really painting, and they're like. It's ceramic. I'm like, well, not totally ceramic. <laughs> I mean, so I, I'm not really sure, you know, if I can say it's just sculpture. But it has a lot of the things about sculpture that I really like, which you need to move around them because they're far away. You can see behind them, and um, their backs are each back is really different, um, which has to do with the front and how mm -hmm. to stabilize that. And so, and the backs or where I kind of test out the color and usually look different. So they're kind of like sculpture too, but the wall was a place to try that out. And I, I really, I really love doing it. It's like such a great process and it lets me work with color in a, in a, uh, in a way that's a little more continuous than um, say something like two or three of some two, which right. the form takes such a long time to make or even planchette. The, the, I painted planchette and, <laughs> one day, but I took like, 
a year almost to make it, so the form. So this is so we're sp talking about planchette. It's a it's a showstopper, <laughs> I'll say, <laughs> um, and a shape shifter. <laughs> um, but I I like the way you led into that because it um, it is also very much about color. Um, it's a it's kind of a mysterious color. It's enigmatic. It's also but it's also the form the shape is also enigmatic like you can't is it convex it's concave it's all of those things right <laughs> um and i think the other thing about it is that it's tactile or it suggests the tactility of um be, at least through its title yeah so That's i'd love for you to t you know a planchette is the object that people use in a séance or on a ouija board <laughs> you know and the touch of the hand you know, connects to the spiritual world. And I think that is such an interesting um, way to think about this piece. Yeah, planchette, I think, means little plank, like just straight up in French. But um, but it is what the, the that object is called on Ouija boards that it, like the group of people put their hands on. So I always like that idea that it's like it takes it takes more than one person to like, you know, get these, you know, set, what, answer these questions with this in this w method. But, um, but they're oftentimes too um, shaped like hearts. They yeah. have this certain kind of shape. So the shape is a little bit reminiscent of that, but then, you know, they're flat, they're not curved. And so, so, you know, the, I, the whole shape itself hopefully looks, and some people have told me they found it to look like it's kind of, uh, becoming mm -hmm. it's in the process of becoming something else while it is itself and you said to me you know when you saw it you felt like it was dancing in the crate <laughs> 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 and, um, you know it has a sense of movement even though it's a still thing and uh, there was a great question we did a, a, a like a walk through with the teens mm -hmm. tell me their official name the uh, walker WACTAC, the walker arts and a teen arts council yeah and um, it, the whole show wasn't up, but that piece was up. And um, um, it was like the best question I think I've ever had about this piece. And this one young woman was like, so what color is this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I love you. That's such a great question. I'm going to remember that forever. And, you know, that's, you know that's, that makes me so happy because, you know, that's what I want you to think about. Like, ah, what color is this? It's not really one color. And they're, you know, it's slight kind of iridescent. And depending on where the light is and what part of the form you're looking at, it, it's like slightly shifting. And Yeah, the color and the form shift constantly. Yeah. It's really extraordinary. I love it. Um, so we have two more pieces I want to talk to and then talk about, and then I want to um, make sure we have some time for people to ask questions. But um, this is a piece called No M, No D, Only S and B. It's uh, now in the Walker Collection as of a few years ago, which we're very excited about. Um, and I thought it might be an interesting place to talk about um, how... Uh, how you think about gender, <laughs> um, because uh, the title of this piece, the M, so no M is no mom, no dad, only sister and brother. Um, so it it speaks to sort of this horizontal reproduction <laughs> um, and sort of sex without, um, well, it speaks to gender relationships too. So, would you talk a little bit about that? Because there, that is threaded throughout the exhibition, but in not in in often somewhat subtle ways. Yeah, I think I think what I mean at the time, I think it was more about dominance and, um, like the sister and brother relationship seems more equal than the parent to. Mm -hmm child to sister and brother and I think that um, I, I, I'm just still really interested in how you know the history of dominance in our culture and um, yeah I, do, I don't know if it's possible to live without dominance but you know I know anim a lot of animals don't live without dominance but there are like mushrooms for example live without dominance mm -hmm. and a lot of plants live without dominance um, but um, but I just that that was kind of involved in that title, and also that they are are all pretty much the same. You know, they are they do look like siblings in a way, mm -hmm. and they do 
I think they reflect to like bacterial or um, insect um, families. <laughs> um, um, you know that that it's a different kind of reproduction, like the way that worms reproduc re reproduce, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of uh, w like that. There's just this different relation. So representing like another kind of order that is not our our order, mm -hmm. and giving that um, some space. And I'm really interested in like you mentioned Rosie Bradotti and this idea um, that's called the posthuman, which I think you know is. Um, and its ideas about the Anthropocene and um, just the, and what's happening kind of in some parts of our world in terms of a big shift really from the Enlightenment to um, acknowledging other life forms like we've dominated all, or we've tried to and, and felt we needed to dominate all the other life forms on the planet and um, and that, you know, minerals and everything in the earth and any animal is, like, there for our use. And so it's, like, a shift in terms of the re kind of respect for different kinds of intelligences and um, not necessarily trying to, like, not put humans at the top of the hierarchy. And, and it's, like, a whole way of thinking of changing that those kinds of relationships, which I'm really interested in. I, I don't say that I'm, like, I, I, I'm fully there but I love thinking about those kinds of ideas and reading about them and I think this is like an early work that um, before I realized that that there was this I don't even think that had really begun it was more like something that happened in the 2000s mm -hmm. and it's kind of a um, it, it's it's very big in in different philosophy and humanities departments this kind of thinking and and um, so yeah <laughs> okay um, Will, I, I want to then end actually with, even though we've not been doing this chronologically, this is the most recent work in the show. Um, this is a piece called Firestone. It is uh, ceramic and it, um, it returns to this representation of the female form that we haven't talked that much about as we've looked, but if you walk through the show, you will, um, there are uh, both references to the body. I don't want to necessarily always call them representations, but well um, there is a fully realized figure in the show as well. Yeah. Yes, there is. There's a fully realized figure. There are parts of figures which we haven't really focused on in these conversations, but I think it all sort of like winds back towards this piece, which um does actually reference a reclining figure. Yeah. And a mineral. And a mineral. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is um <laughs> that's actually yeah, exactly. I think it, the way that you return to the female figure, you found a female form at a mineral show. Yeah, I Tell did. us about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, I, have, I had a public art um, commission, and it was in Colorado, and I decided that I wanted to work with um, stones and minerals from Colorado for the piece. It's called Public Jewel, and it's on the Federal Plaza in Denver. And so I I had to, you know, it was not something I knew that much about and I needed to find some help and I needed to find out about minerals in Colorado and so I and I wanted to find a geologist that I could work with there and so um Suzanne Felsen who was here last night I had to go back but um she's a jeweler and um someone that I've known and um Karen Hillenberg told me a to meet with her, and she told me about um, this, the largest gem and mineral show in the United States is in Tucson. It lasts for like six weeks, and it's in the winter. And so I went, and uh, there I was able to find um, connections to people in Colorado that I eventually worked with. And um, But I also, they had a show there that was, um, it was all of the minerals in, Col in um, Arizona, and then those minerals from different parts of the world, and that was like in the main um, hall. And um, it was really fascinating because, like, like the the um, so there was hematite is and hematite is an interesting mineral because it's always found with iron and it is iron, and um, it can be many it can be red it can be the, I, you've probably seen the kind of silvery black hematite. Um, but there was this one, so there were all these different hematites from all over the world. And one of the things that was 
this is just an aside, but one thing that kind of blew my mind at the show is that um, so the there was this hematite in um, Arizona and it was red and a, a lot of hematite has um, most hematite is hexagonal in form. And then there was this other hematite. It was from Scotland. And it was kind of wispy. <laughs> it looked like it had just come from the moor, which I just thought that was so... Uh, maybe it was a coincidence that that w was what they used. But it's like, oh, it looks like the place that it's from. But I, I saw another one that was um, this form, and it really looked like a reclining figure. And so... You know, I I didn't ha I so I kept that in my mind and then worked on this other piece, but eventually decided to make this piece. It was basically a combination of a reclining nude and a and a hematite crystal, <laughs> and that's this. And it's realized in uh, in um, ceramic, glaze ceramic. And again, it brings us back to sort of the parts to the whole that yeah. it, it's pieced together from these different tiled sections, which I think. Um, you know, it's another thing that like we see recurring throughout the show, but in a whole different way. Yes, it's and another like very complex puzzle that <laughs> that took a very long, t much longer to make than I had <laughs> thought that it would. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I was really glad to see. I really love that combination of it and Corner Basher and To the Wall. And that's it's like well, I we got to get a good picture of that. I really love that. Yeah, I, I think. I'm sorry we didn't put a picture of To the Wall in the slideshow oh, because I think okay. that juxtaposition is also quite strong because it's sort of, um, I think equally it's sort of To the Wall is a, it, it has that sort of vulnerability and delicacy but also quite strong because it's made with that annealed steel and um, this piece also has that sort of, it's it's a reclining figure but it's not a, but not at all um, passive or vulnerable. She's quite Firm yeah. and hard, yeah. really hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, ceramic. That's the thing about ceramic you were talking about before is that you know when you turn something into ceramic clay into ceramic, you know then it lasts a really long time. It's like one of the longest lasting materials, and right. so it takes a long time for it to ever get back to the clay. I mean, you know that's like a serious geologic time before a ceramic will return to clay more than almost any other material that there is, more than metal or right. wood or anything. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of figures in the work that, you know, it was funny, it, even even Verobin, you know, kind of is a figure, it's mm -hmm. head, torso, and foot, like, and the smile, and planchette, and the hands, hands. <laughs> and uh, to the wall, and um, Firestone, and um, you might have to live like a refugee. And then, of course, like, I think, even in some ways, like the way it looks when people are in, you're so inside of burden space, you know, mm. when you're looking at viewers and or people that are walking around burden space, it's like they've become, it's like a performance almost, just having them walk around and walk through there. Yeah. I love watching that. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so I think uh, we have time for a few questions. I think maybe we'll open it up and see. We. Go ahead, right ahead. We'll start here. Here in the second row. So just call it out? Yeah, do you have a mic? You wanna it helps for the uh, virtual audience if you're mic'd. Thank you. And thanks very much for, for the conversation this afternoon. So I've got a question about your process in terms of the flow of the work. Um, you're very obviously super articulate about it and can analyze it, comfortable analyzing it. I'm wondering how much of that uh, is just post analysis when you're creating are you thinking and working and trying to be concurrently sort of I Engaged intellectually in the work or is it is do you do the work? Intuitively and the the sort of the the maybe the greater pictures come out afterwards like are you trying to embed? Ideas into the work or does the work sort of create the ideas themselves? I think it's kind of both. I, I know that's not what you wanted me to say. <laughs> but um, but I think, like, you know, I have some ideas in the beginning, and then as I work on it, and it's realized, like, I'm, like, reading and, think, you know, I'm developing it as I'm going. And sometimes I'm, like, uh, other things, I'm, like, oh, I want to think about this, you know. And so it's really... You know, and I hope that it's kind of like that for people when they like walk through the show. It's like 
you're walking through, you know, you get like a sensation or kind of you kind of think about something and then, you know, it kind of accumulates as you like make your way through the show and then, you know, you have a greater understanding. And that's I, you know, I'm willing to like you can ask me <laughs> more, but that's kind of how it works for me. It's 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 it begins with an idea to do something usually. Um, I always, I kind of need that in a way. Like to, to, I really love to make shows. Like I don't usually make pieces as much as like, I, I like to think about what the, like the gallery shows, like my, um, Sean Regan is here and I've done a number of shows there and it's always like, you know, I want to make a, I need to have kind of a concept about what the show is going to be about, you know, because of that whole idea of, um, uh, circumambulating like a space with objects in it. Sean. <laughs> um, can you oh. um, can you address the title Firestone and maybe oh. talk about the bibliography in the catalog and and how literature or theory or different things maybe come into play sometimes yeah so um firestone is um the, it's kind of related to shulmuth firestone uh it is related to shulmuth, <laughs> but also because it's ceramic it seems to make sense to um uh it seems like a good title, but um, Shilmus Firestone's The Dialectic of Se Sex was the first feminist um, book I ever read. And um, it was like when I was just starting CalArts. And, you know, it really ch kind of changed my life, as many books have. But um, at that moment, you know, I, I, I hadn't, you know, I was uh, it was my roommate. They said we should read this, and we each got a copy, and we both read it. And um, it was it, she was a cell she is a cellist, and um, you know, kind of it really was one of those kind of art school moments of like, wow, I'm a different person now. <laughs> um, and so, in the for the catalog, um, we decided to do a bibliography, which was really great, and uh, because I do like to read, I love all my. You know, all the, I love, that's, that it's maybe like a break away from the work. I'm like, I'm just going to go read for a little while and like let this settle and then I'll go back and go back to work. But, um, so we did a bibliography and Mary and, and all the writers um, and the, um, the designer Sorry, and, Kyle. The, and Kyle Danskowitz, uh, who was the curator in, at Sculpture Center in New York. And, um, I'm, I'm forgetting some another person. Um, did I say Dancing oh, Foxes? Yeah. 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 So uh, everyone contributed to this bibliography, which I just love that idea. And there, and it, and then it's not attributed to who attributed <laughs> what. Um, and so in the exhibition, there's like a reading room, and it's kind of off to the side in the back, so you don't have to go in there. And when you're, it's not like absolutely something that must be done. But if you're interested, you know, we put not all of the books that are in the bibliography, but and it was Mary's idea. I, I loved it. I was like, yes, let's do a reading <laughs> room. And so, um, you know, you can go in there and like look at some of the books that are um, in the bibliography. But I think that speaks to sort of the former question about like how the ideas are sort of embedded and, you know, if as the bibliography sort of came up because every conversation with Liz, like I remember the first time I went to the studio, we'd start talking and then she'd be like, well, have you read and like go to the like wall and f pull a book off the shelf? Like this is <laughs> like, because obviously all of these ideas are like swirling around and getting like digested and, um, and considered that so that they inform the work and i think one of the things that we talked about it in installing the show was um you know at sculpture center there were um no labels the experience of the show was you walked through it and you could just experience the work and have your primary experience and if you wanted to you could look at the um checklist and floor plan and, and see what the titles of the show were and um but there were no didactics or interpretive materials and um and here at the Walker, we have a little more because we have a broader audience that uh, comes and we want to make sure that they have a way to enter the work. But I also think we also wanted to not over-determine and, and sort of put subject matter, attach subject matter too directly and too 
specifically to individual works um, so that the reading room was sort of a way to allowing like all of this, all of these ideas that are so, that Liz has spent a lot of time thinking about <laughs> um, and, and in conversation about. And, you know, and I would say like because the reading room became and the bibliography became a collective um, endeavor, all those ideas are not necessarily ones that Liz in particular is invested in. They're, they're sort of adjacent or tendrils out from your work, which I think also speaks to sort of how, you know, how you think about visitors and the, you know, the visitors encounter with the work. Yeah, it's true. Like there's some books that I didn't, you know, um, pick there and it, it is like that. It's like, uh, you know, and I, oh, I, I love the idea of, you know, it's being an artist you know, you want people to come and see your work and have their own experience, you know? At least I do. I think most artists do, really. And that that's what's valuable, and you want to... If you can, you, it's fun to hear what they think instead of telling people what to think. I mean, I know I'm here now, and we're talking about our ideas and everything, but honestly, it's like the viewer's experience, and, and whether, whether, you know, the, the ideas... My ideas are communicated through the work or not, I think it's still... You know, it's still a reason to put it out there, and um, you know, the, and then there's like, you know, it brings things to the fore, and um, you know, it's a place of you know of uh, encountering new uh, kind of ways of uh, it's not talking, new ways of thinking together, I guess, you know, and I, I, it's really wonderful to be able to. You know, I like being an artist, and I like my studio a lot. I realize that it's been great being here and installing, but one of the things it's made me do is want to go back to my studio. Um, and um, but uh, it's also really incredible to get to show your work. So, yeah, and other people are a big part of that. Well, I think that sounds like a great place to end this. <laughs> um, Let's see if there's any other questions out there. If not. Is there another question out there? On your one large sculptural piece, what made you decide to use mulberry paper, and how did you get that to look so flawless? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I think it's I used mulberry paper because it's really strong, and um, you know that has it's got an interior armature that's made of aluminum, and so rather than like we're talking about planchette, yeah, we're talking about planchette, right? Um, and because there is mulberry paper on a couple, I've Should used it. Yeah, on two is free and some two, that's mulberry paper over steel. Um, but mulberry paper is very strong and uh, moldable. And it's it comes and you can get it in some pretty thick sheets. And so, you know, once I had that basic armature, you know, it's it's instead of using clay, clay would be much more fragile in a way than the paper. And, um, and then there's this uh, glue that lots of, um, conservators use, but that's a great glue in book binders. It's called um, methyl cellulose glue. So that, so I would just you know find the area, cut the basic shape, and uh, apply it, and then it was just about building it up to this to the get the form that I wanted. And there was some sanding. You know, you can sand it once it gets built up. So it was like it's it's like it's almost like a very thin piece of wood, flexible piece of wood. And it does have a, you can see the like, you can see in, it's not super, it's not like, a, it's not like X, you know, that surface. It does have like a kind of little nubbly thing going on, but I, I like that. It has some texture, but I also think that um, it's one of the remarkable things about that piece is how, you know, that relationship of surface to form. Like it doesn't feel like a surface. It doesn't read as a, as a paper surface. It well, feels integral to the form. <laughs> it is. <laughs> the form was very thin, so it is definitely integral. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Um, so you're just talking about uh, books and specifically, you know, reading that book in college and having a sort of revelatory experience where you're changed and thinking in a completely different way after that you weren't put back the way you were before reading that and so in terms of the title maybe this is partially you but also curatorially 
Um, could you speak about the intention of the titling? The title of the show in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think that y you kind of got it. <laughs> that was <laughs> well that, said. That, yeah. that was pretty well said. I think um, it came out of conversations I think Liz was actually having with Ariana at the time, right? I um, mean, I remember going back and forth on multiple titles. There were multiple working yeah. titles over the length of the show. But I, I remember you brought it forward in a conversation. Um, and then we kind of, there were multiple texts that went back and forth about it too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's not the perfect title, maybe, but I think it really, um, you know, I think that it kind of speaks to the work and how I kind of, you know, I'll do something and then I'll change it up and then I go back to it. And each thing is a little different. Like, I have a hard time making the same thing over and over again. But also, you know, in in light of the these concepts, like um, the post-human and things like that, that's like a pretty new way of thinking about things. So it, it, ca it could carry a lot. And, um, but I think it's also important to think about it in the, in through that lens of um, a feminist approach and a um, sort of a recognition that um, you know we there's uh, there's that um, linear static idea of history and like the way things are that's the way things are <laughs> that's the way it is <laughs> but in but I think when we talked about, you know, going back to the X sculpture, it's like, it's different all the time. It marks you in a time and a place, but it's all, but each moment is different or each time the sculpture is in a different place, it's different. And I think that um, it's, it's sort of a wreck. I, I think what the thing I liked about when we, got, when we landed on this title was um, the way in which it, it suggested that just because things have been a certain way, we don't necessarily want them that way and that there's the possibility of other ways. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if it's something works, it works. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying like total revolution all the time or anything like that, but, but I, it, is, it is that idea of um, being open to, um, you know, change. Yep. One, I think we will, we'll do one more question. Hello, Liz. So uh, you said that you started as a photographer, and I saw what you said that you started as a photographer. And how soon after uh, working with that, that medium you transferred to sculpture? Maybe you can talk more about it and why. Um, you know, I, I, I was getting my degree in photography at CalArts, and um, uh, the, the photographer who had also graduated from CalArts like five years before that. His name is James, Case, James Casebeer. I don't know if any of you know his work, but he does these, um, he makes these kind of really elaborate models of spaces and he lights them and then he takes a photo. It, well, back then it was with a four by five, probably not anymore. <laughs> but um, so I, I became his assistant in my last year there and um, I, and I, it had been occur occurring to me that, like, I mean, I, I mean, I love photography, but um, I was really, I had like done some kind of installationy stuff with with photographs and some sort of experimental stuff. Like, I did a piece um, that last year where I had um, different people that I knew. I set up a four by five camera and a really long shutter release, and I had them. I wasn't, t so I wasn't taking the picture. They were to take the picture when they felt that they were at their most masculine and then to take another picture when they felt they were at their most feminine, but there was no mirror or anything. It was just, and um, so I was kind of fooling around with a lot of things anyway, a little bit, um, uh, but it was working for James that I realized I really loved building these <laughs> models. I really liked it and I, you know, and I understood that, you know, he was getting like this one view of the, like he would pick the one view of this thing. And I was really into the whole thing, <laughs> you know, like, and he was building the whole, he was, but I went, and he didn't build out the whole 
model. He built out like a portion of it that he was going to photograph. And, and so it just dawned on me like, oh, great. I've got my degree in photography, but I want to be a sculptor. You know, like, so, um, so I started pursuing that. And then this is like the last mention of a work. And I know we've all been here a long time. But um, so it was, a, it was kind of a hard transition. And one of the first things that I made was I got this bucket and I put... Um, everything that you needed to make an oil painting in this bucket, but not in the right order and not in the right amount. And so it was just this thing. And um, I took a photograph of it. And, um, and then um, this piece that's in the show now used to do the job, I think was like the, that came after that. And so, you know, it's um, all these different ingredients and it's a combination of two things and with a couple of other materials thrown in of everything you need to make a bronze sculpture and everything you need to make a bomb, but not in the right order and not in the right amount for either of those things. And it's formed into a cube. So, you know, it was like a slow, <laughs> it was like a slow process. And in the catalog, you'll see one of the last photo pieces that I did, it's with Catherine Liu's mm -hmm. essay, mm -hmm. which is, again, it's just, it's like n about totally don't put it back like it was. It's yeah. so funny. <laughs> that's when I look at it and I'm like, oh, yeah, there it is. So, so that's what happened. Had to get out of the frame. And well, walk we're around. really glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Your contributions to sculpture have been immense. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. I want to invite everyone to go into the galleries. As I said, they're open until 6 p.m. So please, if you have not seen the show, please visit it. And even if you have, now that you've heard Liz talk a little bit more about it, perhaps you'd like to go visit it again. So thanks so much for coming.